I'm Mali Bonner, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Hunt. I'm excited to have Grammy Award-winning artist and director Mali Bonner on the show. He's directed a great film about an early black Mormon who was a slave who was part of the pioneer companies that founded Utah. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have my first Grammy Award winning <laughs> artist on the show. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are and how'd you get that Grammy? Yes, uh, Mally Bonner. Um, and the Grammy came from writing on a Gladys Knight's gospel album, One Voice gospel album. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Gladys in Vegas was in my same, my family's same ward. Oh, really? Up. Yeah. Did you grow up in Vegas? I did. Grew up oh, in Vegas. Wow. Yeah. So, so she was running Rebs, work. is that your team? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, running yeah. Rebels. That's is right. This, is this the Larry Johnson years? Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> the, good, the good years. They know. were very good years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so we did music uh, later on, though, because she ended up being my manager, which is also interesting. Gladys Knight was your manager. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I know. So um, I was in a man group. I, the people say boy band. I don't do boy bands. I was in a man group. So I, I was in a man group, and she was our manager. And that's just how I ended up getting involved with her with songwriting. And so I wrote on her gospel oh. album. Now I'm going to have to talk to you. I would love to get Gladys Knight on here. <laughs> she, she's incredible. She's a legend, living legend. Oh, of course. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, very good. And it's not just Gladys Knight you've worked with, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so LA was at where I went after Vegas. And, you know, my mom grew up teaching voice and everything. And I learned the voice just because I grew up in the home and she made sure all the kids learned it. So when I moved to LA to do music for myself, artists would come up to me and be like, hey, can you help me with this? Help me with that. And I was like, yeah, sure. Just no unknown artists. And then then it became known artists. And then it became reality TV shows. So I just kind of became the guy to develop artists. And so, oh, yeah, wow. Katy Perry, Kesha, and and then songwriting, you know, as well with like Gladys Knights and, and Stevie Wonder, stuff like that. So you, you've you hung out with Stevie Wonder? Yeah, yeah. Oh We're gosh. working on his gospel album. He's, really? Yeah, yeah. It's great. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, it's funny. I, we met last year. I'm trying to remember what that was. Education was Week. BYU. Education Week. Well, it was Education Week. I think it week? was. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. And um, I just assumed, because I've seen the Bonner Unity Choir, which you're a part of, right, mm -hmm. as well? Well, it, it's my mom's choir. But okay. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, to me, they're so ubiquitous, I just assumed that you lived in Utah. So I texted you a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, hey, we need to get together. We're going to talk about your movie, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And, and then you texted me, you're like, well, I'm flying in at this time. I'm like... You don't live here. <laughs> I'm flying in, <laughs> yeah. people think I live here because I'm. I'm honestly, I feel like I'm here just as much as I'm in L.A. Because I'm here like every other week. Every right. other week I'm here, and I just kind of book up my day. And so I'm just happy that my day is for you. <laughs> so this is great. <laughs> well, I, we appreciate it being here. So, so not only you're a Grammy award-winning artist, but you're uh, an award-winning filmmaker. Um, tell us about your film. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm taking that in because, you know, I, I still to this day feel like I, people are like, so you're a filmmaker. I'm like, no, I just made a film, you know, <laughs> <laughs> even though the film did so well, it did so yeah. well. Um, so gosh, I don't know how far back you want me to start with this story because it, it just began with me learning about the history. You know, mm -hmm. I learned about early black pioneers because I had heard of a few, but I didn't really know, you know, mm -hmm. I had heard of Elijah Abel, didn't know who he was, but the name sounded familiar. This is just like five years ago. I'd, uh, I knew of Jane Manning James, knew a little bit more about her, but that was basically it. But as I learned more and more, 
at the B1 celebration in 2018, the church mm-hmm. put on the celebrating the 40th anniversary of the priesthood. One of my listeners gave me a ticket, so I went to that. No way, you were there. <laughs> was Wasn't there. that incredible? All of it our was. family coming out on that. St- I it mean, was incredible. Oh man, it, yeah, it was a it was a really special event. And your mom's choir yeah, was there. Yeah, yeah, and Gladys conducted a choir. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> um, anyway, so it was at that event that I was learning like everybody else. I'm like, what? Who is this Green Flake? I was like, enslaved and a member of the church? Enslaved by another member of the church? Like, yeah. it was just blowing my mind. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, and so I honestly, I, I felt uh, embarrassed. I, it wasn't like, oh, great information. I felt like, I should know this. Why don't I know this? You know, especially me being black in the church. My whole life, I've grown up in the church. And I don't know these things. And I've had people ask me questions and I don't quite know how to answer them. And so it just switched something in me and I just dove in and reading turned into writing. And a month later I had a couple hundred pages and 10 songs. And I was like, I I think this is a movie. That was the beginning of it. Yeah. Well, very good. So the name of the movie is... Yeah. His name is Green Flake. His name is Green Flake. Um... Uh, we wanted to make sure that we people knew, um, or I, I wanted to, me and Arthur Van Wagenen actually, uh, wanted to make sure that people knew that Green Flake was a person and that we don't forget his name. Because when uh, when you hear Green Flake, you think, what's a Green Flake? You know, you don't, it's not a typical name, right? Right. And so his name is Green Flake is the name of the film. We ended up shooting the film three months after I wrote the script. Um, and it was it was an incredible experience because it was just miracle after miracle just to even get it done that quickly, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I don't know why, but race and priesthood issues is one of my favorite topics. It's February. It's Black History Month. And, uh, you know, I've known about Green Flake for at least a decade. And so... I'm always looking for stories that people don't know. Um, Margaret Young, she was my first interview ever, and we talked about Jane Manning James. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my second interview was with Mark Staker. We talked about Black Pete. Yeah. It was February. Wow. This is actually the ninth anniversary of my podcast. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> so, Happy anniversary. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And so I'm always looking for, you know, these stories you don't hear about. And Green Flake, we have not covered at all on Gospel Tangents. Oh, wow. Um, maybe a little bit in passing. And so yeah. this is this is going to be great to have a film dedicated kind of to the Green Flake. So for people who don't know, maybe haven't heard the name, yeah, tell us about Green Flake. How, how did he grow up and all that sort of thing? Yeah, so Green Flake um, was... Uh, inherited by the by James Madison Flake at inherited. around inherited. That's such a I weird know, word. I know it's crazy, right? And yeah. for that to be so normal back then, right? So he was inherited by um, James Madison Flake. His father uh, gave him to him around eleven years old, mm-hmm. and so he spent some time in his youth um, in uh, North Carolina and Mississippi. And around the age sixteen, um, they made their way the Flake family and. Uh, Green Flake, uh, made their way to Nauvoo. Um, and Joseph died right around the same time he came uh, into uh, Nauvoo. Uh, Green had joined the church. Do by we this. have any idea if Green knew Joseph? We don't know. We don't mm-hmm. know. I've we've There are some who have said that he was there when Joseph was there for a short period of time, that he served as one of Joseph's bodyguards. And there are so those who say, we don't know anything, you know, so we don't know. And I'm sure over time, more things will come up, you know, mm-hmm. there'll be this letter that we've been waiting for or something that can give us more information. Um, so uh, we're not sure of the connection between them. Um, Green, uh, Green Flake uh, builds a home for his enslavers in Nauvoo, which also sounds crazy. He's a young teenager. Mm-hmm. He builds them a home. He's a member of the church at this time because uh, back then uh, the policy was you have to have the permission of the enslaver to preach for the missionaries to preach to the enslaved. And so if they said it was okay, then great. And then you preached to the enslaved. Green was preached to. He chose to be baptized. So he's a member of the church at this time in Nauvoo. And 
Joseph, uh, Brigham Young becomes the leader, not the prophet at the time, but the leader of, of the church. And he says, we're going, you know, uh, we're heading to Utah. And Green Flake was put uh, to be a part of this Vanguard company. And in that Vanguard company, uh, there was someone who had to drive the first wagon, at least coming into uh, Salt Lake, and that was Green Flake at 19. Now, when I think of that, and then the number 19, you think of a missionary. You know, right. you think of these, our sons, our, our, our brothers, our sisters at age 19 doing incredible things, and he was enslaved, driving the first wagon on this epic pioneer trek. And for me, it forever changes trek, you know, to know that there was an enslaved man carving that trail um, for those to come through. And uh, yeah. So there's a story, and I think Paul Reeve ruined it for me. <laughs> I don't know if you heard this. He's ruined a lot of things for me, too. <laughs> we love Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. But the story was, I think Margaret Young told me this, that um, when Brigham Young was coming into the Salt Lake Valley, Green Flake was in his wagon, and it was he to whom Brigham Young said, this is the place, drive on. Right. Have you heard that story? I have heard that story. Is that a true story? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And so, Paul thinks it might not be. I'm right. Like, Come on, Paul. That's I know. a great story. I know. Come on, Paul. <laughs> Enough with the historian stuff. You know? um, no, but um, it might be, you know, but it, it, it may not. But either way, we know that when he did say this is the right place, it, it could have been a question mark. This is the right place. Who knows? Because he came after, you know, but Green Flake was already yeah, here. Yeah, Green Flake got here before Brigham Yeah, Young. so he's already here. The crops are planted, um, and, you know, people are tilling the ground. Work is being done, and then he says this. He's not saying it to establish it. It's already been established. So what is that comment? That's a big – to me, I hear it as a question. Okay. And I'm, I, I would imagine someone oh, said, yeah, this is it. You know, <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I see it. Um, but it also says – a lot about what that relationship might have been between Green Flake and Brigham Young, because we know Brigham Young is a strong leader, and it's not like whoever gets to the front is in the front. Why was Green Flake the one to drive the first wagon? Why was this young man trusted to lead the way? And so uh, we know that there was. And it's a, not like he'd been here before, right? Right. <laughs> and so it's like uh, there is a unique relationship that I hope to learn more details about as we keep uncovering more history about Brigham Young and Green Flake. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Um, so do we have any more information or is it pretty yeah. sparse? Well, no, uh, there, there is some. There is, you know, what what is unique and uh, really confusing, to be honest, is so we know that Brigham Young um, are, is the reason, the catapult, you know, behind Utah becoming a slave territory, 1852. Mm -hmm. There was a big debate. Brigham Young is on one side leading the debate that Utah needs to be a slave territory. You have Orson Pratt on the other end arguing the other direction. And Brigham Young and that group wins the debate. Utah is a slave territory. What does that mean for Green Flake, uh, for Oscar Smith, for Hark Wales, who were all a part of that Vanguard company led by Orson Pratt, that, or that Vanguard, that early group. What does that mean for them? So that I'm sure the Black Saints probably thought this is going to be different here. You know, I just can't imagine what they must have felt when it felt like, oh my gosh, it's like we're back in the South again. I know. You know, I can't imagine. So... Um, Brigham Young sent a group on to San Bernardino. Initially, Green Flake was a part of that group to go. Oh. Yeah, so he was on, on – you have one record of him going with that group, and then it shows that he was back, and then that group left again. And so I don't know if they began a journey, came back, and then uh, they went on without Green, but Green ended up staying behind and lived with Brigham Young. So he's living in the home with Brigham Young, and Brigham Young is – renting his labor uh, for, a, I don't know, a certain amount of oxen or something, you know? Renting his labor. Right, right. It's, it's like, I'm, I'm saying it like it's so normal, right? <laughs> it was and then. It, yeah, I know. And it's, it's just, it's fascinating that uh, our church history or the, or the history of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints is so integrated into American history. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're in stride with what was going on during the times. And I think before we would have thought that not us, you know, that maybe the world, but not us. And um, it, it was us. But Brigham Young had Green living in the home and Agnes Flake became ill. Her husband passed away and she wrote a letter to Brigham Young or uh, Massa Lyman did on her behalf saying, can you send me Green to build us a home or sell him? You know, and uh, Brigham Young didn't. Um, in fact, he ended up being the catapult for Green attaining his freedom in the next year. So Green really didn't have to, in his family, now he's going to be married and have children, didn't have to endure slavery in Utah. And so that to me is a conundrum. So on one hand, Brigham Young is enforcing a form of slavery, and then for Green Flake, he's making sure that he is free. He's breaking the rules to make sure that Green is free. Well, that's very interesting. Paul's got a book coming out this year, hopefully this year. <laughs> Historians, the, they keep adding more to it. It's like, well, just take it as is. Just give it to us. Yeah. So it's on the 1852 legislature. Um, I've talked to, to, to Paul previously about this a little bit. Uh, he gave a presentation at MHA five or six years ago. I don't remember when it was, uh, along with Christopher Rich. And Christopher's a lawyer, mm-hmm. and he was making the case because Br- Brigham Young was arguing we need to have slavery. Christopher Rich is trying to make the case that the act in relation to service was a form of Emancipation? Emanci- well, not emancipation, but gradual emancipation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've talked with other people. Um, Sally Gordon was like, but Illinois had, in fact, the, the statute was based on an Illinois statute. Yeah. And we, we do look at Illinois as generally a free state. Um, and so I do wonder, do we need to look, relook at our history I know you had said in a previous interview that Utah was a slave state from 1852 to 1862. And, you know, Brigham Young freed Green Slate. Would it, do we need to change the narrative that, yes, Utah was a slave state, but they were looking for gradual emancipation? Um, Yeah, if you're looking for more detail, but it doesn't change anything for anybody who's enslaved. You can call it whatever you want to call it and add whatever things. At the, am I free to go? No. Okay. You know, and so, yes, um, there are levels of slavery and servitude. Uh, but for that group that came into Utah, it had no difference as to whether or not they were free to go. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter? It doesn't matter unless... Um, you know, there's never a civil war and Abraham Lincoln was never president. So if that never happened and, and America chose to do slavery for another 30 years, you know, beyond most other countries, then it does matter because then you do have the children of the enslaved because in that, in that servitude law, an act or an act, uh, in relation to slavery, um, then they would be, have children that can be free. Uh, but it didn't really apply because so it, wasn't it didn't enough apply time. to the people now. But their children would have been right, free, right? Okay, yeah. And, and and there's there was other things with it, you know, like they can choose whether or not they if if they're saying I'm going to sell you here, the enslaved person has a say in that. If they're like I do not want to go there, then yeah, can, yeah. Brigham Young tried to make it a more compassionate form of slavery. I guess um, there's that story about Biddy Mason. In California, yeah. who freed for her freedom, sued for her freedom, yeah. and won, and she was enslaved by a Mormon. Right. <laughs> Robert Smith. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it, yeah, there's, it, it's tough because we don't, like us as human beings looking at this history, it doesn't feel good to say, well, it was a softer form of a, it was a lighter form because it's like, you know, it's slavery, slavery, you know, right. but at the same time, it was a different form of slavery. It wasn't chattel slavery. It, it wasn't what we think of when we think of what was happening in the South, you know, 
And so there is a difference. And whether or not Brigham Young was trying to find that middle ground and he was trying to just be a politician in that moment, okay, we have the Southerners over here, we have the, um, the Quakers over here, what's the middle ground? Maybe. Um, it definitely looks like he was finding a middle ground, but don't know what his thought process was as he was debating. Because when he debates, he uses words so, so um, unequivocal, like this is it. You know, and so I, I don't know what he was feeling or thinking as he was drawing that line down the middle. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Mally Bonner, the director of Green Flake, the movie. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about slavery and specifically Brigham Young. What are his thoughts on Brigham Young? I feel like even though Brigham Young, you know, uh, led the, the debate in making Utah a slave territory, that does not change the fact for me that he was this incredible prophet that led the largest pioneer migration in American history across the country. Like he's unreal. He's incredible. He also, you know, and so it's not either or I, I do think that we can acknowledge someone's accomplishments and also their sins. Thanks for listening, and I hope you to continue to enjoy Gospel Tangents. Consider becoming a Patreon or go to gospeltangents.com shop, and you can get a cool tie, a hat, or even a nice mug. You can also get a sweatshirt, so check it out at gospeltangents.com shop.